how much longer? Have you said that at all in the past two years? How much longer? Have you said that when you're dealing with Comcast today, production team? How much longer (laughs) when you deal with any kind of thing you don't quite know the answer to? Like when you're riding to with your, you you know, with maybe your family on a particular trip and you, you know, like what was really a 15 minute drive for your family, but for you as a young person in the back of the seat with your sibling making the lines on the seat that you're not supposed to cross with your fingers, like, and you just like, you, you like, like things happen, tantrums happen, the, the, the emotional energy of things going on up here and in here are exposed to us when we have to wait or when the answer is not yet, we, we get a glimpse into the things that we trust in, but also into um, like the, 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 just ourselves, really. The, the, the course of these past few weeks have been to look at the story of the Israelites, to look at the story of this guy Moses, who, who you may be moderately acquainted with in the sense that like, okay, I know he's like a guy in the Bible, but, but was sort of called to lead a movement of people out of slavery in Egypt and into this, quote, promised land, like this, this place where there was going to be a land, according to Exodus chapter Chapter 3, flowing with milk and honey. It's going to be a fertile gland, gland place. It's going to be a place where the, the, the presence of God can like, like, like just be there with the people of Israel and they can be forged together as a people that can demonstrate to the world around them the graciousness and goodness of God. And yet that journey is a 40-year one. Spoiler alert. And it's chock full of moments where you see like the limitations of the human experience. When we see humans like putting trust in things they should never put trust in. When you see things that really have to do with waiting. And we've talked in this series about words like identity and belonging and purpose and, and how we might discover those things. But if you're anything like me, you know that like you can have an experience on a Sunday morning and by Sunday afternoon, you can be right back wrapped up into all of the other things that were vying for your attention over the course of a given week. And so today we want to look at this idea of, of how much longer, like, like how, how do we live in a space and a time when when like these words like identity and belonging and purpose and God having those things for us is still true, but we live in a context where there's all kinds of nonsense and there's all kinds of uncertainty and the outcome is uncertain. What do we learn about the nature of God and what do we learn about the nature of ourselves? One of the things this story, the, the Israelite story, the book of Exodus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, for all of the things you're like, yeah, I don't get that and I might not get that, but if you get something about that, it's this, that desert times, like times of wandering, times of uncertainty, when I, I'm, I'm qualifying that now because I'm going to say it a lot. The desert times, seasons of uncertainty do not mean the absence of God's presence. Desert times do not mean the absence of God's presence. The book of Exodus, which we had been looking at and kind of flying over last week, ends with this phrase. In all the travels of the Israelites, whenever the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle, they would set out. But if the cloud did not lift, they did not set out until the day it lifted. The cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle by day, and fire was in the cloud by night in the sight of all the Israelites during their travels." Did you catch that? Like God's presence was in, among, and around, and proximate to the camp of the Israelites. The the Africa Study Bible has a little footnote in this. Kind of comparing at the time what would have been the prevailing way you get God to like do what you want God to do, which is that like you, you perform the rituals, you do the sacrifices, you behave yourself because God's watching and he is ticked. And if you can do all of those things right, like the, the good vibes might emanate up to wherever this God resides and you will be like spared and preserved another day. Right? This, this kind of idea is it's chock full of, of like Greek and Roman mythology as well. Right? We've got these, these gods and goddesses. They're, they're capricious. They're a little surly. You got to keep them happy. 
functionally, we may not cast offerings up today, but if you're wearing your favorite jersey in the attempt to get the, the football gods to provide the set outcome today, you might be participating in a modern version of this idea. The Africa Study Bible says the essence and the, the thing that like sets apart Yahweh and sets apart this, this concept for us and the readers to understand is the idea that despite how nonsensical the Israelites behave at times, God's presence is interested in dwelling in, around, and amongst them. Like the presence of God is concerned with their restoration, is concerned with their refining, is concerned with what's going to happen in their story, despite the fact that they do all kinds of tomfoolery along the way. Now, now what matters for you and I is, is, is that many times, right, it's like, like, like we can live in this idea that like God's presence and provision um, is, is something we should experience in a desert time. But can we be frank? Like this is a brilliant idea to wrestle with, but this is functionally a really hard thing to feel. Like, like Josie was sharing with us earlier, a few minutes ago, even the words of Moses, the guy who's getting these words and, and communicating this message, is having times where it is a real struggle and it is a real grind to feel and experience those things. I don't want us to hear the idea this morning that, um, that I know that you're going through hard stuff. I know the world's a little crazy, but God's with you. So so sentimentally, wrap that in a pretty bow, put that on an Instagram canvas, and just have a pleasant day. And minimize all of the things you're feeling and all the grief that you're experiencing and all the frustrations you have. No, no. I'm inviting us to wrestle. To wrestle with the idea that things can feel chaotic, the desert seasons can be exposing things to us about us. Can, we can be learning about the character of God. We can be functionally learning about all kinds of things we trust in that cannot deliver on their promises we can be saying in the process of that unsightly things before the presence of Creator God, and yet God is interested in proximity and presence and unwinding our trust in these things and demonstrating that when all else falls apart, there is that God. God's presence and provision wants to show up in this desert season. I'm not trying to minimize anything. Like, like I'm, I'm not trying to say that, like, but because of that, the toll of the past two years, you should just not feel anything. I'm not trying to say that, like, if you're having a difficult pregnancy or you're struggling with fertility, that you should just minimize that and just, will you, will you just, will you just trust God? But to say, like, as we are wrestling with really hard and heavy concepts and things, one of the things that, that God is interested in telling Israel over and over and over is, I'm with you. I'm there. I'm present. Of course, it doesn't solve everything immediately, which is part of the trouble, right? I, I don't want to promise you a build today that, like, if you trust God, then, like, your bankroll will look different tomorrow. That if you trust God, like, all the things you're worried about today, you won't be worried about tomorrow. But, but, but rather to offer that, that the presence and peace of God helps us carry and reframe these burdens in, in, in the idea of the, the presence and the provision of God in and through those things. That's the story of Israel. That's the, that's the, the thing that in these 40 years of desert season, Israel's going to experience. That, that's the real lesson, like unlearning dependence in all kinds of ways in which their lives look like, like enslaved people in Egypt, as opposed to being dependent on this, this provider God who cares for them more deeply than they care for themselves and care for one another. Okay, like, like moving on to this the kind of second concept, it's kind of a corollary concept that desert seasons will expose the limitations of power in the things that we're trusting in, right? Um, like, so, so, so like this is, this is, this is, you know this, right? That like, that like, seasons of extreme weather, seasons of extreme elements will we'll find the cracks in, in, in all of the little things that you, you weren't thinking about on a normal blue sky kind of day. 
Like yesterday, we had a chili cook-off with, uh, with a, a, a kind of guys in our church that was part of the J-term thing that we had been talking about. That, uh, and if you, if you didn't get any word on that, that's, that's part of why we would invite you to sign up for the connection card, just because those kinds of things come across in some of those emails and whatnot. But like, so we're standing outside yesterday, and to do it in, in a spirit of COVID safety, that's kind of the interest of our time, um, we are standing outside outside yesterday for hours. Now, did you know yesterday was cold? It was cold yesterday. It's cold today, too. Um, now, now, here's the deal. Like, I, I, I was ready. I was ready. I was, not gonna, I was not going to be denied the opportunity to enjoy everyone else's chili. And so I, I, had, I had layers on, a nice coat, a hat on. I had two layers of pants, and, and, and I put on my, my, my heavy shoes and, like, hand warmers and gloves. And, and this is all trivia to you, except, you know what? I didn't wear thick enough socks. And like 15 minutes, I was like, okay, I can do this thing. You know, like do the thing where you go over to the bonfire and hope that you don't catch your foot or someone's, you know, you just you do those things like that that are not particularly wise, but, you know, you, you, you're desperate. So, so over the course of four hours, what happens, right? Like this, the elements prey upon this weakness in my system of defense. Um, we... <laughs> might proclaim in worship and song collectively a, a devotion and allegiance to the God of the universe. But, but our lives, particularly times when we're told no, particularly times when we're told wait, particularly times when we're told not yet, will expose to us other things that we trust in. Does this happen to you or is this just me? Like, like you will learn in suffering, you will find yourself right? You will find the things that you trust in. You will find the things that you, that you kind of rest in, particularly if you guys like control and certainty. Does anyone in this room like control and certainty, right? Like, yes, I like a great deal control and certainty. And so this is exposed in Numbers chapter 13. Like, we're going to hone in the rest of our time together on this little section of the text. So in the book of Numbers, kind of a continuation. They get to the cusp of the promised land. Here's the land. It's going to be good. Like, they're going to move in. God's promises are going to be fulfilled, right? Yay. Yay, Moses. Yay, Israel. You did it. Go get them. And, and they get to the cusp of the land, and they, they basically say to God, hey, we want to send some spies in there. We want to see what the, the field looks like. And and so 12 spies, one representing each tribe of Israel, like 12 guys are going to go and they're going to spend 40 days scoping out the lay of the land, which they do. They scope out the lay of the land. They come back and in Numbers chapter 13, they've got a little bit of the fruit that kind of proves that it's agriculturally sound and fertile. But they, they, they say to the people, hey, you know what? We got a problem. The problem is the problem is we get this really fertile land, but there's these, these people there, these Canaanite people, and they're like mean, and they're scary, and they're tall, and they probably don't want us there, so we probably shouldn't go. Like, like, like in this moment, it's like all this journey out of Egypt, out, like it's suddenly exposed again, like the, the, how like complacency and control become kind of the idolatrous, like, like let's just stop here and like have a nice little life for ourselves. Because there's, there's like scary things down there that we don't want to think about. And so what, what the people of Israel like literally do, like there's they're like, you know, Joshua and Caleb are the two guys of the 12 that are like, no, 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 we need to go. We need to do the thing that God has told us that we're supposed to do. And everyone else is like, nope, 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 shut it down. Nope, we are really happy. We're really controlling here. And, and so this is a moment I think that probably you understand in your story. Right? Like when, you, when your idea of control, when your idea of certainty is threatened, in what ways does it cause you to, to act out? It might be a window into the things that we actually trust in. Right? Israel was stuck in this moment, in this desert season, where they were learning all of the ways they really kind of just preferred, kind of a, they had normalized kind of an Egyptian life for themselves despite the fact that God is continually showing up and showing them a better way to live. This, this is very true in, in our story, right? Like, so Baruch Fishoff is a, is a guy who's written a little bit about the like, people's kind of big reactions in the middle of the pandemic. Have you seen any of that, even virally? Like big feelings, 
acting out, a bit of a, a, a tantrum, we might say. And, and like, we kind of go, what, what's behind that? What's behind that? Well, Baruch Fishhoff, he says this. He says, you know, one of the things that, that we have kind of, in this past hundred years, grown accustomed to is just a very normal life. Like, like I said this last week, kind of like the Seinfeld moment. Like nothing happens most of the time, and then we have funny stories that we accumulate along the way with, to nothing happening. And he says, like we, so, so a lot of us, we've kind of got a baseline kind of picture in our mind that life was like pretty easy and bad things don't happen in the world and like the world kind of goes like pretty much the way we want it to and, and we can kind of get our way there if we wait it out and try hard enough. And he goes, hey, like, like, the world has just kind of shown us the past two years, like, that we have a lot less control of it than we think. We haven't conquered nature. You, you might grow up, you grew up in the United States, you, you probably didn't envision a world where an election happened and then a group of people were like, nope, not real. Like, that's a fabric of society thing that makes you, wait, 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 What? If you grew up thinking that like laws and regulations like are off, it should be that like the people that, that hold to those things and write those things often follow those things, then some of the past two years have been really unsettling. Not to mention the fact that like, is this not true? Every time we're kind of like, hey, I think that I think it's gonna, I think it's, I think we're ready for like some good times again. You're like, nope, cancel those plans. <laughs> Like, his, his point is, what's, what's being shown to us? Why are we freaking out? Because we had normalized a picture where, like, we were pretty much in control of our lives. And when, when we saw kind of the thin veneer underneath that, it's really, it really shows us how limited and small we might really be. So, so when we think about, like, going to a store and going, where is all of the soda? And where is all of the toilet paper? Like... Come on. Like, how do I live in a world where these things are not guaranteed? It's exposing some of the things that we've just normalized. And, 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 and so worship, you may, not like, you may not like the idea of coming to church and singing songs. You may, not, you may not like the idea of like, yeah, worship songs aren't really my jam. I like to listen to whatever, whatever kind of music you like to listen to. But like, you're a worshiper, man. You're a worshiper. We, we are worshipers. We devote our energy and our attention and our money and our emotions towards things often that, that cannot bear the weight of that thing that we've elevated. We do it with people. We do it with leaders. We do it with control. Um, Dr. Kenny Kamesho says this. I, I think this was just really good. He said this last week in a message um, in Annapolis. He said, certainty is a mask for desire, for safety, and control. So when we consider that the world that God made seems to frustrate that desire to give us so little certainty, we're forced to rethink things. How we square ourselves with a loving God who won't let us know everything or feel safe on our own. The answer we begin to wrestle with is that perhaps we're not intended to find safety and security on our own, Perhaps we're made not for certainty, but for confidence. Like the thing that Israel is going to spend 40 years learning is that the way of Yahweh, the way of God, is a better way and a more life giving way, and that this God's character is set apart from all of the characters that they knew in Egypt and all the powers and principalities that had, had, had power over them there. And, and this is true for, for you and for I as well. Like to come this morning to say, hey, hey, beyond the songs that we're singing and the things that we're aligning ourselves to, what, what, are, what are just functionally the things we're trusting in today that, that maybe aren't delivering the life that is truly life? And how does the character of God meet us and show us? Right? Just as we're putting trust in our seats this morning by, by sitting down upon them, that, 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 that the things that we're dealing with, that the God of the universe can bear the weight of them. And then daring to, as Moses did in the Psalm Josie reference, bring those things before that God and say, hey, this is where I am. This is what I'm dealing with. Wilderness seasons, desert seasons can also distort our sense of reality. Has that ever happened to you? That's what being hangry really is about, right? This amplified feeling that's, that's birthed out of, like, something that's going on in our tum-tum. 
Yes, I did. Just say tum tum. <laughs> right? Yep. 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 And uh, so when something's going on in my tum tum, right? Like I'm 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 angry. I'm I'm like I project. I say things to people that like I don't. I'm sorry for the things I said that when I was hungry. Right? Like we know this to be very true. Desert seasons, times of hungry, angry, lonely, tired, have the ability to distort our sense of reality. So, so for some of us, the past two years have been really cathartic and clarifying. And maybe there's been some moments like that for you that have led to like, hey, I have a, I have a better focus of like what I value. I have a better focus of like, I, I have to have a relationship with my neighbors, like this whole like in and out, never talk to anybody thing. I'm over that. Or, or, hey, I really like the fact that I've just been home a lot more. That's a, there's been some catharsis in this. But for others of us, there's, there's been really kind of a warped and distorted sense of reality, like prolonged seasons of suffering and uncertainty mess with us sometimes and lie to us about the nature of things. Let me tell you how this happens in Israel's story in a few really, really fast ways. Number one, we see Israel's feelings being manipulated by the pain that they're feeling, right? So in, so in Numbers chapter 11, there's this, there's this moment where, um, there's this moment where like the Israelites are tired of manna and, and they literally say this to, to Moses and to the assembly. You know what Egypt had? Really good fish. We were slaves. We were in bondage. Children whipped, beaten, bricks without straw, terrible mistreatment, but the fish, so good. So good, right? We hear that and it's laughable because we know it's not rooted, like it's rooted in a moment. Like it's the kind of thing a toddler says in the back seat when they want to get out of the car. Like it's the kind of thing we say when we're not being rational, but we do this all the time, right? It's important for us to be in touch with our feelings. We talk a lot here about bringing our full self before God, being in touch with our grief, being in touch with, with trauma, identifying the questions that we have, the uncertainty of those things. But, but feelings are intended to be felt and not worshipped. And, and, and so circumstances have this way of manipulating our feelings. So fear, the fear of what's unknown, one more time. Hey, we're complacent here. We're comfortable on the cusp of the promised land. We don't really want to shake things up. Oh, there's scary nine-foot men in there. No fact-checking. Cool, we'll hang. We'll hang. Circumstances have a way of manipulating the way that we feel. Feelings are meant to be felt, not worshipped. Ekemeni Yuan says, A God that cosigns on everything I do, say, think, and believe is not God, but is an idol of my own making. Like, that's, that feels a little harsh, I know, right? Like, but this is the idea of, hey, let's, let's come back to a place of reality. Let's come back to a place of honest wrestling when we feel hungry, angry, lonely, tired. Let's be in touch with those feelings. Let's know that they're there. Let's get below the surface of those things, but not worship them not elevate them over the character and nature of God. Another thing that, that, uh, that, 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 that moments like this can do is, is it, it can minimize the thing God's already done. Like, I have to be really fast here, but the irony of that like a, a group of nomadic tribes is scarier than the predominant superpower who enslaved you for hundreds of years, who God has already delivered you from, is laughable to you and me because we're not feeling the things that they're feeling. But, but that's something we often know to be true, that, like, like that many times the current moment, if we don't step back, if we don't take captive, if we don't think strategically, if we don't bring these things before God, that, our, that we, can, we can be manipulated into getting sucked into just all of the energy of what we're feeling right now and not look back over the course of our lives and go, well, what has God done here? And what has God done here? And what has God done here? And, and that, that is a really important piece of like just building a, a muscle of spiritual maturity. I know it's kind of a weird way to say that, but, like, but the exercise of like, hey, let's bring our full selves here. Let's think about thankfulness. Let's think about the areas where God is forgiven, where God is restored, so that the things that we're dealing with right now can be framed. They're still felt, but they need to be framed. Like the it also turns the, 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 the wrong voices into, into voices of help and turns enemies into threats. So the people of Israel, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be fast on this. So, so again, the people, there's 10 of these spies that are like big, scary. Nope, don't do it. We're not going there. Joshua and Caleb are like, hey, hello. Um, God, has, God has told us that we can step into this land and not die. And what do they do? Chapter 14 
says this in, in verses 1. That night, all the members of the community raised their voices and wept out loud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The whole assembly said to them, If only we had died in Egypt. If only we had died in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us out to this, only to let us fall by the sword? He'll, they'll go on to call for the death of Joshua and Caleb. What, what, what moments of desert season can do is can... can get, there, there are all kinds of people right now preying on your outrage, preying on your fear, preying on the uncertainty of the moment to sell you something, right? In a moment of clarity, we know this. We, we know that like we Google something and then we're going to spend the rest of the day like being haunted by the skirt that we searched. Like, do I really want it? You wanted a Ravens jersey, did you? I'll show you all day. I am the Google machine. <laughs> we know right now that, like, in moments of crisis, sometimes the most helpful people and the consistent people are often the people we, we project all the heavy stuff onto, and then, like, we put our trust in the things that will tell us in the moment or sell us a picture of certainty. It's, it's a really, it, and so it's important for us to have what I'll call, like, a balanced diet of, like, interacting with and studying and centering ourselves around the character of God. Like, like three hours of outrage podcast. And 15 minutes of, like, sermonizing on Sunday, like, you can see where the imbalance is built, right? And it's not a commercial for, like, well, you need to listen to more sermons. Let me give you a recommendation. Like, no, like, but to say, like, but if we acquaint ourselves with God's word, if we acquaint ourselves with God's character, if we, if we work to, then it helps us kind of see rightly. Because in moments of crisis, there are people that will aim and, and principalities that will aim to prey on that. Which, and then lastly, it will often minimize the role of difficulty and suffering. We said that already. That, that, that like, that like we, I, I, I often say when I'm frustrated, and I usually only say this to one person, I usually only say this to my wife because she knows that I'm a baby. And in this way, like, I just, you know, it's like sometimes I just go, can, can just something be easy? Can something just be easy? I have said that many times over the course of past two years when things that are supposed to be easy are not, in fact, easy at all. Gathering people, not gathering people, doing things. Turns out not doing things isn't particularly easy either. Nothing is easy. And I have to come back to the reality of like, where in this book have I ever been promised ease? I've never been promised ease. I've always been promised presence, restoration, love, guidance, forgiveness. And then ease is sort of a craving of my own flesh, which I don't even think is all bad. Right? But it's manipulated and preyed upon. And the last thing I'll say, and this will conclude our time in, in interacting with the scriptures this morning, is that we're going to spend the rest of our lives trying to figure this out. Like the essence of desert seasons is that you can today understand all of the theological, all of the emotional implications, and you can go, well, that, that really buttoned up the thing I felt today at 9 a.m. Thank you. And then next week, you can be back and like, everything stinks. I hate it all. <laughs> We're going to spend the rest of our lives kind of wrestling in and around the desert seasons, you know, because what Israel's going to do, like they, they get, st like basically God tells them, you know what, you're in this for 40 years now, one for every day you didn't trust me in this process, um, which feels a little needlessly cruel to me, you know, like I'm, because I'm kind of like, that's not fair, like I'm a justice guy, right? Um, and, and, <laughs> And the reality is what God is doing here in this moment is sort of breaking down, again, a picture of their dependence. Like, hey, because if you got there, it's just going to look like Egypt 2.0. And we've got, we're building something better. We're building something bigger than the way things used to go there. And, and so God stays put. The people, the people who, were on, who, who wanted Joshua and Caleb killed decide that they're going to go and they go without the presence of God, and it goes badly. <laughs> and the story kind of ends in a weird way. It's a comfort and a challenge to you and I to say, hey, um, today, 
might be a day where everything is coming up you. Carry that properly. <laughs> but, if, but, if, but if today feels like it's crazy and chaotic and uncertain, um, come back to where, 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 is, where is their presence? Where is their provision? Let's gather around that. Let's center ourselves back on that. And let's let the guidance and goodness of God like move and prevail over all of the lesser things we trust in. And I, and I just want to tell you today, if, if you get nothing else out of this, this is not a formula to figure out. This is, this is a thing we'll spend the lifetime like acquainting ourselves with more and more. That, that like over the course of time, um, you know, like I like. Have you ever sat down with somebody like and you like shared all of your problems and you poured your heart out and you like nothing really changed in the circumstances over the course of that forty five minutes, but but because of because of the presence of the person you were pouring all of that out to, you're carrying it differently. I, I think that's what I'm talking about here that the presence of God invites us to, to learn, as Eugene Peterson says, the unforced rhythms of grace. Like, to learn what grace is really about, particularly in times of uncertainty and suffering. So, so when we come to a time of communion, and there's, there's, uh, there's bread and juice that you could have picked up on the way in, and if you want to take a moment to grab that, if you didn't, you, you can. I, I want to just, there in the back, just in those landings, like, I, I think I just want to push us again to this idea that what we're not doing is kind of checking a religious box that keeps us in good standing for the week, nor are we, as, as I thought as a child, having like a cool little snack time in the middle of all of this, usually towards the end, and I would have preferred a snack at the beginning. What we're doing, um, we're not... We're not inviting God's presence. Like, we didn't, you know, if I peel it back the right way and I don't spill any juice on the floor, like, it, it won't taste like styrofoam and it won't, like, you know, like, it's not an incantation to God's presence. It's an invitation to acquaint ourselves with the fact that God, God has promised to be, to be with us, to, to, to come to God and find rest for our weary souls. And so in Psalm 90, verse 12, Moses continues on, and he says, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Relent, Lord, how long will it be? Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love that we may sing for joy and be glad all of our days. The invitation of this next few moments is not to wrap up and button up all of the uncertainty in your life, but to invite into that uncertainty, into, that fr into those frustrations, into that anger, the presence of a God who cares about you so that we might number our days and carry them well and gain a heart of wisdom. Lord, as we come to this time of communion, we come with anger, we come with sadness, we come with celebration, we come with frustration, and we come with uncertainty. But as we come with all of those things, would you remind us that you are here, that you are present, that you are working, and that these little things that we hold in our hands and participate in are an invitation to pour ourselves out and participate with you in the thing that you're doing in this world. In the name of Jesus, we pray and think and reflect and press on. Amen.